Let's welcome to the stage, Lindsey Hill. Okay, way too many great acts to follow. <laughs> um, and on my walk from the hotel, I was bending over because I was having a few contractions and two snails literally slimed faster than I was walking. So I think they were sending me the message, slow and steady, be patient this morning. So um, I'm so excited to be here with you all, see so many familiar faces and lots of new faces, which is exciting. Um, and I, I'm excited to, to spend time with folks this week. Okay, so I am the great-great-granddaughter of slaves. I am also the great-granddaughter of Klansmen. And every day I process what that means for me and what it means for my kids. And when I think about the divisiveness in our country and the contradictions that we're all living with, it is not beyond me that I have had to grapple with these my entire life. <laughs> My brother and I killed it in this picture. <laughs> Yay, 80s. Um, there were many, many, many powerful things about my educational experience. There were also many negative things about it. When I was in elementary school, my parents had chosen to move into a community where they thought the schools would be uh, better for my brother and I. They were both the first in their families to go to college and it was important for them, for my brother and I, to have the best education possible in order to ensure that that would be a reality for us. When I got into elementary school, I was automatically tracked into the lowest math class. I didn't realize at the time what was happening. All I knew was some of my friends were going to a different room. I went to a, a different room um, and we were working on different things. When I came home and my parents asked why I didn't have homework or the homework that I had uh, was less rigorous, I told them we were doing this really cool thing where we got to go to different classrooms. And they realized that what I was experiencing was tracking. My mom made the decision as my white parent to go into the school to advocate for me because she didn't feel as though, and my dad did not feel as though, teachers and our school leader would listen to him in the same way. She advocated for me, they had me tested, and they determined that yes, in fact, I was uh, supposed to be talented and gifted. That one piece of advocacy that my parents needed to engage in changed the trajectory of my life. I would have gone to college either way, most certainly, but I wouldn't have taken algebra in eighth grade, I wouldn't have taken AP classes in high school, and I wouldn't have gotten into the college that I did. This fuels my passion for education. My experience, sadly, was even better than my little chubby brother. <laughs> um, and my parents actually made the decision for him after numerous negative experiences in elementary school and high school where he was perceived to be violent and off track and aggressive and too loud spoken to send him to a private school where at least then they knew they were paying for what they were getting and could advocate in a more aggressive way for him. So even within our household, two different realities based on gender and based on how we were both perceived. We know that this is true, not just for individuals like me, for, but for young people all across our country every single day. Despite all of the hard work that all of us in this room, our predecessors who've come before us, and those who have just entered the sector are engaged in, we're not just seeing gaps remain stagnant, oftentimes we are seeing them grow. We are making things worse. When you look at data on uh, college graduation rates, we're seeing a huge growing gap in those from the highest classes compared with those from the bottom quartile. I would argue this is because we're not having the real conversations about both the history of our education system as well as the history of oppression in our country. And we will not see these gaps grow until we do, or gaps close until we do. We're operating from a system that most of us, at least I speak for myself as a teacher, um, after my experience as a student, I decided I was going to be that teacher, that teacher who reached other students, who saw the potential in students that other folks might have overlooked. And in a lot of ways, I was able to do things in a more transformational way. And in a lot of ways, I perpetuated the status quo. 
I taught test prep. My own biases played out with my students every single day, and I had no space, no time to talk about that with someone who could help me work through them. I realized more and more the kind of higher up that I got in the system and got to see this wasn't just happening in my classroom in Brooklyn, this wasn't just happening all over New York City, this was, wasn't just happening across Washington State, this is happening across our entire country and frankly even parts of our world. So it occurred to me, if, the, if it's true that systems get the exact results that they're designed to get, what was our education system actually designed to do? So I learned the history of our education system. And one of the facts that I learned was actually that the state of Massachusetts had higher literacy rates before compulsory schooling was initiated than they have ever had since. That families fought against compulsory schooling, and I'm using that term very specifically as opposed to education, because those two things are very, very different, because they believed that it was going to be a system to indoctrinate their kids. And in fact, that's exactly what it was, and still is. So the system proliferated across the US in the early 1900s, and some of the designers said that it was designed to be instruments for the scientific management of a mass population. Schools were intended to produce through the application of formulas, formulaic human beings whose behavior can be predicted and controlled. This is still true today. We also know that there is a racialized history with education. Slaves were not allowed to read and be educated, so we were excluded. At worst, when we were included, when you consider Native American boarding schools, they were tools to strip people of their language, their culture, their heritage, and, and their family ties. The motto of the Carlisle Indian School was literally, kill the Indian to save the man. This was a school. I've recently fallen in love with Doris Lessing. Maybe you all have read her work before. Um, and I know I should not just be reading quotes off slides, but apparently I'm doing it. Uh, <laughs> ideally, what should be said to every child repeatedly throughout his or her school life is something like this. You are in the process of being indoctrinated. We have not yet evolved a system of education that is not a system of indoctrination. We are sorry, but it is the best we can do. What you are being taught here is an amalgam of current prejudice and the choices of this particular culture. The slightest look at history will show how impermanent these must be. You are being taught by people who have been able to accommodate themselves to a regime of thought laid down by their predecessors. It is a self-perpetuating system. Those of you who are more robust and individual than others will be encouraged to leave and find ways of educating yourself, educating your own judgments, those that stay must remember always and all the time that they are being molded and patterned to fit into the narrow and particular needs of this particular society. How many of you feel as though you've spent your time post your K-12 education unlearning more than learning? I can say that that's true for myself. All of the things that I learned that Christopher Columbus discovered the United States. <laughs> Uh, the history of slavery, the history of the civil rights movement, the history of manifest destiny. All, all I feel like I've been doing as an adult is unlearning things that I was brainwashed to believe as a young person. And yet we wonder why we have the issues we're having today. These have been some of the historical structures that we've put in place throughout our history to keep certain groups oppressed and our schools perpetuated stereotypes and myths in order to support each one of these structures. Our schools have been tools. They are not neutral. So when I think about deeper learning, when I think about my own experiences in Talented and Gifted, I was exposed to learning that mattered to me. I was exposed to peers who were able to work on projects that mattered to them. We were able to collaborate, work together, bring what was happening in our real lives into the classroom. We were able to be curious and to question things. But I also never learned about myself. I never learned about my history. I never learned about the real history of our country. So just having access to rigor, just having access to collaboration, and some of these other things that we know are critical for young people is not enough. 
we need to think about critical consciousness, racial equity, gender equity. We need to talk about classism. We need to talk about all of the isms in our system if we're truly about deeper learning. My favorite quote from Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, is from Letter from a Birmingham Jail. I will not read this one to you. <laughs> but what I will say is, we oftentimes, a, a big reason why systems perpetuate is that we blame other people. We think, oh, other people are the reason why this system is to blame. This system is, is getting inequitable outcomes. When actually it's also because of all of us. And one of the things that MLK said that I think really stood out to me is that shallow understanding from people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright rejection. We know that bias is playing out in our classrooms. It's playing out in every single one of us. And it doesn't make us bad people. We were all programmed <laughs> to be biased. The more we can talk about it, the more we can actually be the educators that our young people need and deserve. Examples of implicit bias have been growing. We're doing more research to unpack and understand how this plays out in our world. Powerful studies on the difference between uh, folks with white sounding names and African American sounding names in terms of job callbacks. This is from Julie Nelson uh, and her work. We've also seen this play out along lines of gender in very, very powerful ways. So what do we do with it? We actually know that suppressing or denying it increases prejudice rather than eradicates it. Believing that we're just good people who are trying to do good work will make things worse, both for ourselves, but also our students, their families, and our communities, who we say we intend to impact, but so often ignore and blame. Openly acknowledging and challenging our biases actually allows us to develop strategic interventions against them. We also know that we've had a very limited conversation about racism as a country since our founding. We think about it in terms of interpersonal dynamics when actually it exists at the individual, the institutional, and the structural levels. And until we can understand how things are playing out in our classrooms individually, between students, among students, between ourselves and students, as well as policies in our schools, procedures that we implement, and then more structurally how systems interact with each other, our housing system, our education system, our healthcare system, we won't actually move the needle on the things that we all came into this work to do. One of the things that we can do to overcome this is to bring an equity lens to our work. What do I mean by that? It's like a contact lens. This is from the National Equity Project. I want to cite my sources too. <laughs> the metaphor of a lens allows us to see our context in new and re revealing ways. We can look at policies through an equity lens. We can look at outcomes through an equity lens, power, relationships, and solutions. What does racial equity mean? It means closing gaps so that race or any other aspect of identity is not predictive of outcomes and that requires targeted strategies to focus improvements for those who we've most marginalized. Moving beyond services to think more strategically about policies, institutions, and structures. And we're all capable of doing this this work and this thinking, regardless of whether we're classroom teachers, school leaders, we're running districts, we're on school boards, we're in philanthropy, we all have a role to play. We also know, hey Camille, <laughs> thanks to Camille Farrington and her team at the University of Chicago Consortium on School Research, we know that our schools are not set up to produce whole, happy people who can effectively enter our society as adults, pursuing their own passions and making our world a better place. And we need to think more holistically about the components of broader student outcomes that will support that. One of the things that I think we can go much deeper in is 
integrated identity and a woman who I've recently been able to learn a ton from in the last few years, who's talking about this, is Aretta Hammond. What is the intersection between deeper learning and culturally responsive pedagogy? If you haven't heard of her, now you have. <laughs> Highly recommend her book. And one of the things that she talks about, this is one of her slides, that oftentimes when we think about culture, we're only thinking about superficial or surface elements of culture. What food do you eat? What clothes do you wear? We need to think more about the deeper levels of culture, the collective unconscious, how folks make decisions, how they believe, what they believe about themselves, what they believe about the world, what their relationship is to nature and animals, how they think about fairness and respect. Oftentimes, we don't actually have that conversation about culture in our school. We think, oh, I had the day where I invited your family in and they brought in that food and we ate it. Don't you feel like you belong? <laughs> Not that the food isn't good. <laughs> We're seeing examples of innovation pop up all over our, our <laughs> country, and I would also say we've seen this for generations now. Folks have been fighting back against the system of schooling and oppression since it began. One of the uh, groups I've gotten to know over the course of the last few years is the Oakland Unified Office of Equity, specifically the Office of African American Male Achievement. At the time, T Superintendent Tony Smith, when he took over in Oakland Unified, he realized that they were sending more black boys to prison than to college. Let me say that again. A school district was sending, a, a mandated school district, compulsory education schooling, again, was sending more black boys to prison than to college. He believed it was unacceptable and used his privilege as a white man running the district to do something about it. So he went out into the community, engaged leaders, did a listening tour with young men and their families, and decided we're, we're going to establish this office. They've developed the manhood development class where young men have the opportunity to talk about stereotypes that they're facing in their buildings and beyond. They learn about things like stereotype threat and how to buffer themselves against it. They also learn that they have a voice, a really powerful voice that no one needs to unlock in them, but they need to step into themselves. I'm gonna keep moving on. The San Francisco uh, Unified Ethnic Studies course, a course one day a week, has seen results of a 21 percentage increase in attendance, students taking 23 additional credits, and a 1.4 increase in GPA. We don't see these results anywhere else. Allowing young people to learn about their own histories, their identities, to talk about the stereotypes they're facing, and to talk about what's happening in our country and the world makes them want to come to school more. Makes them feel like whole people. And that translates not just in that one class, but in all of their other classes. I'm over time, so I'm going to keep moving. These are my kiddos. <laughs> when I think about a school for my sons, it is one of the most depressing decisions to make as a conscious parent or a parent of color to have to decide between a school that offers rigorous opportunities and access to deeper learning and a school that will see my boys as whole people, which includes their racial identity. That should not be a choice that any parent has to make. We can make these two things into one. And I, I'm so grateful to be here with all of you to see how you're doing this in real time. I'm over, so I'm gonna stop now. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lindsay.